He makes us whole. Glory to God. We receive our communion. Is everybody served here? Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Prepare yourselves. Thank you to God. Just thank him, thank him. Thank him, thank him. Thank you, Jesus. The scripture says, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you. That the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. I want us to take the bread together. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. We thank you for this body that was broken for us. And yes, Lord, we remember what you did for us. Thank you. Let's eat the bread together. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Yes, thank you, Jesus, for the cup, the new covenant in your blood. Thank you. We do this in remembrance of you. Let's drink the cup together. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you. We bless you for you say for as often as we eat this bread and drink the cup, we proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. We are thankful that yes, you are coming again. We honor you, Lord, this morning. We thank you for what you did. We thank you for this meal that heals. The meal that sets us free. The meals, the meal that honors you as we commune with you this morning. Thank you, Jesus, that you are risen and now you live within us. Christ in us, the hope of glory. On this Resurrection Sunday, everything comes alive in our lives. Everything that is connected with us, everything that is around us, anything that was dead that needs to be resurrected, resurrects now in the name of Jesus. So, Father, thank you for life, the resurrection power that is here this morning, that is healing us, that is touching us, that is restoring us, oh God, to that place in you for the glory of your name. We thank you and we bless you. We give you honor and glory in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. What a powerful time in the presence of God. Yes, celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. He is the reason that we are here. He's the reason we are celebrating uh, Resurrection Sunday. Turn to your neighbor and tell them he's the reason we are celebrating today. Yes, yes, yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. And as you turn to your neighbor and find your way to your seats, I want to encourage you, those who are behind, back there, please move to the front seats. Hallelujah. Move to the front seats as you talk to your neighbor. Make sure you have talked to your neighbor. 
Hallelujah. Put your hands together for this praise and worship team. Hallelujah. And everybody is obedient when they are told to come forward. I need you to move to the front in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Asha, please help me. If you heard me, please move to the front. Thank you. Thank you. We appreciate you. Thank you for moving to the front. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. I'm talking. Yes, you, you, you. Yes, yes, yes. Come on, come on. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Glory to God. Amen. It's a wonderful day, a resurrection Sunday. Hallelujah. We want to thank God for my daughter here, who God has brought uh, here with us. We were together from, uh, I think she came. On, they came on Friday, and we have been together this weekend because yesterday we had a glorious time at the launch of East African Day of Prayer. Come on, celebrate and thank Jesus for what he did yesterday. I'm seeing some of you are just looking at me like, I said, let's celebrate Jesus. Come on. <laughs> Hallelujah. And I'm so grateful that they came to be with us, of course, uh, the big day yesterday. And uh, now here we are on Resurrection Sunday, worshiping together for the glory of God. She's, they are not, they're not strangers here. They are part of this uh, DEC. When they are in town, they are part of Divine Encounter Church. This is my daughter right here, and she cannot go anywhere. And there's nothing she can do about it. And her husband and Mshindi. There's nothing they can do about it. Glory to God. So celebrate this wonderful couple that have been a blessing. Stand up, Evelyn, please. <laughs> Hallelujah. A great testimony. Can I give you two minutes to share your testimony? Yes, because that testimony is powerful. Please. And that is that song, Naiwe Maombi. I've just, my spirit, I've been singing that song since she landed. And it won't leave me, and it keeps taking me deeper in God. Glory to God. Come, 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 come. Wow. There's nothing I can do about it. Minnesota. Minnesota. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's an honor to be here this morning. I remember the last time I was here, I was really, really sick, actually. And I, she kept on telling me, you have to minister. You will sing. And I told her, I can't sing. And... Uh, some of you didn't know what was happening to me. Some were thinking, why is she looking so, the way she's looking. But uh, down the line in my marriage life, uh, uh, we've been married with my husband for the past, uh, now, actually, next week on the 7th of April, will be 12 years in marriage, you know. And um, uh, 10 years down the, down the line, we trusted God for the fruits of the womb. And uh, we've been a blessing to so many people in the world, and yet we had a, a, a silent cry in our hearts that God would bless us with a, with a baby. And so uh, the last time I was here, I was pregnant, but most of you did not know that I was pregnant. And uh, God blessed us with a baby boy. Uh, he's now turning two years, and we bless the Lord because Scripture says that it may tarry, but it will surely come to pass. And so I don't know, some of you probably have been waiting on God to, to give them papers in this nation for so many years, and they are asking, and they cannot go back home. I want you, when you look at me and my husband, just know that there is hope and there is a God at work. Indeed, we are a walking miracle that God is able to do exceedingly abundantly above all we can ask or imagine. And so we are testifying on the, of the goodness of the Lord. God blessed us with a baby boy, and this is what I keep on saying. That he had to give us a boy. It's not that we girls are not good. Of course, I am a girl. Uh, but uh, boys, they, 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 they continue the generation. They, uh, they, they, they carry the, 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 the name and the generation keeps on going. And so we, we are grateful because God bl blessed us with Mshindi. Mshindi means victory, a winner. And so some of you here, God is going to give you a great testimony. You will be emerging as winners. People have been waiting for you for 20 years. You've never gone home. Am I speaking to somebody? Uh, people have been waiting for God to open doors here in this nation. And for sure, for sure, God is not asleep. He's not yet, he's not yet done with you. 
you're going to testify as we are testifying today of the faithfulness of the Lord. And if there is a man seated next to you, tell them, oh, yeah. You're ne seated next to a man that has an attitude, turn to the next one, tell them, oh, yeah. You know why? It's because I, 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 say, I say this, and my time is out. I say this because God blessed me with an amazing man, African man. We know. He needs to stand here. My husband, please come. <laughs> African men, if, if God blesses you and uh, you, you are blessed with a man like this one, I, I salute him. I keep on saying he has partnered with God to make me who I am today. And of course, every time I used to stand and say we produce music and children and people are like, which children? You know, and here we are, a testimony that indeed marriage can work with or without children. Would you like to hear his voice? Yes. Are you sure? <laughs> okay. Praise God. Amen. Wow. You look so lovely. <laughs> and we, we are so happy that you're here again. Uh, Pastor Zipora, together with your husband, your family, every leadership that is here, Bishop, we just salute you and we say thank you for this opportunity that you're here. And we bless the Lord. As you've heard the testimony, I cannot repeat that. I'm just a happy man. You know how it feels. <laughs> uh, at least my name changed from just a bunda to Baba Mshindi. And you, know, <laughs> and you know, Mshindi means a lot, a lot, a winner, a victor, you see. So we thank God for that. It's a big testimony that we keep on celebrating uh, for that. God bless you. Amen. Yes, amen. He's a man of a few words and I'm a woman of many words, but God <laughs> saw it fit. We are together and we bless God. Mama, we love you and we celebrate you. <laughs> celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. Amen. What a powerful testimony that you have. Oh, my. God, may the Lord continue to be glorified. Every time you speak about it, it's just like you feel the presence, the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. The child of promise. Mshindi. We give glory to God. Amen. Amen. And so uh, this morning, Divine Encounter Church, you're so blessed. Say we are blessed. Hallelujah. We have them now. We, I am turning to my right. <laughs> and to my right, I have Bishop Kennedy. Kimiyue. You were there yesterday. Yeah, yeah. You can hear that, Bishop. You really, really blessed us yesterday. Uh, God could not have chosen the right person to be there at the launch of East African Day of Prayer. I am so glad and privileged to know you, to have connected with you. It's been a blessing since you arrived just to share with you and for, for the love of God that you have within you and also just for the men and women of God, that, that passion that you have. And just speaking from that place and bringing up a, a hope to us for the glory of God. So we are so privileged and honored to have you. Thank you so much for honoring us with your presence yesterday and today at Divine Encounter Church. Here you are, and we are so grateful that you are here to join with us and to share what the Lord has deposited in you. And with you is Elder, and I know I'll invite you so that you can invite him to come and speak to us because we are also grateful and honored that you are here with us. These are great men of God. So DEC, please stand as we honor God and welcome the vessel of God that he has sent to us in this place and this time and hour to come and speak on us on Resurrection Sunday. That's how much God has loved us. Put your hands together as we welcome Bishop. Hallelujah. Thank you, Bishop, for being here. And feel free to share what God has given you. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Jesus is risen. Yes. You say he's risen indeed. Okay. Jesus is alive. Jesus is he's alive forevermore. Okay. Let's do it again. Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive, 
Now let's give him a mighty clap offering of praise and of thanksgiving. You may be seated in his most glorious presence, and it is indeed my joy, my great pleasure. I was telling people, you know, when I landed, you know, uh, at the airport, uh, the person who came to receive me was none other than Pastor Zipporah herself. What an honor. You know, for some people, they send emissaries. Uh, but, but you came yourself. Uh, and uh, I'm honored for that, uh, for you coming out of your way uh, just to receive me. And uh, as we were talking, uh, as we were driving, coming here, uh, you know, there's a way in which uh, God connects you with somebody. You find yourself flowing in the spirit. Uh, are you getting what I'm saying? Uh, you know, there's some people, it's like, so how do I begin? Uh, what posture should I have? Uh, what tonation should I have in my speech? You know what I'm trying to say? You try to rearrange yourself. But when I came... Uh, and we were talking and just trying to understand each other and appreciate each other. I could see our spirits were well connected. And so, again, I'm so very grateful for this invitation and for the honor to be the speaker at the East African Prayer Day. Amen. Um, this lovely couple... <laughs> You know, we have come a long way with these lovely people here. <laughs> we have travailed in ministry together. We, we have ministered all over the place. But this is a powerful woman of God. Back at home and all over the place. Uh, she has a program that she does called Praise Atmosphere in Nairobi. And when she's doing Praise Atmosphere, it's like everything stops in the city of Nairobi. And all the roads lead to her function. So she is a woman that uh, we honor and we thank God for the gift of God in her life. And for Agunda, just standing and being with her. Uh, you know, people don't know that our success in ministry also comes from the partnership that we have with our spouses. Uh, and as I say this, I bring greetings from my dear wife, Joy. Uh, she's in Houston. We couldn't make it to come here together. We had visitors. and uh, But what I was trying to say, when you have a partner who believes in you, who stands with you, who walks with you, uh, who is supportive in ministry, is a great asset. And so, again, we just want to bless God for you guys. Keep it there. Keep it there. Keep it there. With me is, uh, uh, for us back home, we call them Mze. And it was this, you don't even call their names. You, you just say Baba So and So. Uh, but this is a man that I treasure so, uh, so much. Um, they have seen us grow in ministry. When I joined the then Nairobi Pentecostal Church, um, I was just a young lad. I was seated at the back there like my brother, uh, just enjoying the ministry of great men of God. And I never knew at any given time that God will call me from what I was doing and uh, get into full-time ministry. And so growing up there as a young man, some of the people that we looked up to and uh, who uh, mentored us and who stood with us, uh, through those stages of growth in the Lord is none other than uh, Mze, Elder Bill Nasir. Would you want to just come and say hello to the people here? Uh, his good wife couldn't make it to come, uh, but he's here. And uh, I keep on telling him, when you see me looking good, he, this is the guy I copy from. <laughs> just say hello. Uh, uh, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord again. Thank you so much, my bishop, Bishop Ken. I refer to him as Bishop Ken. And what a privilege and honor for me to be here, to stand on this holy ground. This place, the worship, pastor has made me touch the heart of God. He took me far away that even when the Holy Communion was passing, I wasn't even aware if she didn't tap on my hand 
Wow, the Holy Communion would have passed me by. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, Pastor Zipporah. Thank you for being a woman of God. And thank you for having us here. Thank you so much. Uh, the thing bad, oh, she's gone. Yeah. Oh, oh, the thing bad. Thank you so much for blessing us. I just want to say thank you because Jesus has risen. He has risen. Tell your neighbor, He has risen. The Lord of Lords has risen. The King of Kings has risen. He is no longer on the cross. If you see anything on the cross, that's not our Jesus. Praise God. Pastor, I see this church growing. I see that one day you will have a big piece of land. I see that one day you will have uh, ministries, children's ministries, women's ministries, a parking lot, the youth, the men's ministry. God is doing things. God is doing things. This is my bishop. Amen. This is a man of God, and God has deposited so much in him. I saw him grow, and God picked him, and God made him a vessel that he wanted to use, and God has used him. God has used him as an usher in the church. God has used him as a pastor. God has used him as a minister of visitations, minister that is in charge of praise and worship, minister that is in charge of um, encouragement. Those that were leading, God lifted him up to a senior pastor. And in Sidham, if you are a senior pastor, really God is so ready to use you. And God has used him. And then as deputy bishop, thank you. And right now, I know that God is going to use him in a much bigger roadway like what the vision that God has given Pastor Zipporah. This is a big church. This is a big church. Why don't you say amen to that? Amen. This is a big church. Thank you very much for having us. I am married to a beautiful young lady called Esenyesio, a mother of five children and a grandmother of six. That's how young she is. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bishop. This is my bishop. <laughs> Come on, let's give him a big one as he sits. Amen. Where do I begin? I was going to begin with my testimony, but I'll leave that for another day. I think I would come back. Uh, so that I can encourage some of the young people who are in church, who are trusting God for a wife. Like he mentioned, I was just a young man, you know, ushering in the church. My wife, she was a singer, singing in the choir. Uh, and lo and behold, God brought us together. Uh, I got my wife in the church. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Are there some people here looking for husband, wife? Yeah, they are right here in the house of the Lord. <laughs> I'm not so sure what you'll get when you go out there, but I can guarantee you if you want a God-fearing, a God-loving spouse for marriage, you get them in the house of God. Beautiful. Today is the Resurrection Sunday, and I thought we need to bring our minds, our thoughts on the cross of Jesus. So allow me to share with us on the subject, the benefits of the cross, the benefits of of the cross. And if you could turn with me to the book of Colossians, chapter 3, we are going to read from verse 13 down to 15. And then we will be reflecting on eight benefits that we can draw from the cross of Jesus. You see, when we talk about the cross, it is not just another thing. We are going to see that the cross is very central to our faith. The cross is the whole gospel. <laughs> uh, it is all about what God is about. And as we get into the scripture and then go into the body of my message, we are going to just build it up from the Old Testament into the New Testament and see that right from the very beginning, this was God's plan for the redemption of mankind. If you're together with me, say amen. 
Colossians chapter 3, 13 to 15. When you are dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all our sins, having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness, which stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away, nailing it to the cross, and having disarmed the powers and authorities, he made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them by the cross. Shall we pray? Our Lord and Heavenly Master, we thank you for this great day as we reflect back at the cross of Calvary. Today, as we talk about your resurrection, because you died and you resurrected from the dead, you are alive and well. You are God who never ceases to be. You are everlasting. And today, as we reflect on this great happening that brings us to the place of our salvation, Lord, I pray that you may take our mind, our spirits, and that you may cause us to be made known, knowledgeable and more understanding on why we have the cross. And so I thank you for everyone that is gathered here. And I pray your blessing over the ministry of your word because we ask this with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. And the people said, as I said, the cross is of great significance to the Christian faith. That's why we have crosses all over the place. That's why people wear crosses. That's why we talk about Jesus on the cross. And so if you remove the cross, you remove the gospel, the good news. You remove the significance of the redemption of mankind. And if we were to go down into the Old Testament, we will find that God, right from the very beginning, as we are going to see in a short while, he had already provided Jesus as the lamp of God that was going to be crucified, that was going to be slain for the redemption of mankind. When we look at the history of the Israelites, as they journeyed through the wilderness from the time when God asked Moses to build the ark and then the tent of meeting, which came into the synagogue and then later on into, rather, into the temple and then the synagogue, we see that the messianic message, the message of God redeeming and reconciling mankind to himself is very central. The thread line, the watermark, of the gospel is the cross. Somebody say amen to that. Apostle Paul, who declared that if Jesus had not died and resurrected from the dead, then our faith is futile. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 14, Paul puts it this way. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is useless. And so is your faith. In other words, without the cross, we have no message. Without the cross, all this sacrifice that we make, all this journey that we are talking about as believers is futile. It will not avail to anything because the cross is the central message of the mission of God. So flow with me as I take you back into the Old and into the New Testament. Because this message of the cross transverses from the Old Testament into the New Testament. In the Old Testament, what is God doing? He's prophesying, he's foretelling, and he's talking about the Messiah that would come. All this time, from the time when Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, God had already put in place the redemption plan for mankind. Because you see, God knows the end from the beginning. And he's all-knowing. And right from the very foundations of the earth, he knew that there was only one way that man would be reconciled back to him. 
And that is through the sacrifice of blood. And that's why when you read in the Old Testament, it's all about sacrifice. It's about blood. It's about priests who go into the presence of God and offer the blood sacrifice so that the sins of mankind can be atoned for and somehow God would have mercy on the people and the wrath of God that would have come over the people would be taken away. Are you following me now? I hope I'm not boring you with this stuff. I just want us to walk into the place where we see that when Jesus died on the cross, there are certain benefits that we can draw from what he did on the cross. It's not just another day that we celebrate every year. No, 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 no. There's something very significant. If you don't get the message of the cross, then you got it all wrong. It begins with the cross. So the scriptures say that Jesus was the lamp of God that was slain from the foundations of the earth. And when you look at the narrative of Abraham, who was told to slay his son. You remember when Abraham goes into the mountain and he's told, you know, slay your son as a sacrifice. And before he slays the son, God tells him, no, 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 don't slay your son. There is a sheep in the thicket there. You remember that? And by the way, those of us who are a little bit into theology know that that is a typology of the messianic message. Because... This child, Isaac, was the only child of Abraham. And it is this same child that he's bringing to the altar to be done what? To be sacrificed. But in the, old, in the New Testament, whom do we see? God bringing his only begotten son, who? Jesus. And he does what? He crucifies him on the cross. Are you getting the significance here? So all through the scriptures, right from the book of Genesis into the New Testament, we see that thread. We see that watermark of salvation, which is the cross. In the Exodus experience, what do we find? The children of Israel, as they journeyed, before even they journeyed in the wilderness, the first thing they were told to do is all of you guys need to slay a lamp. And the prescription of what kind of a lamp was very clear. It must be a male. It must be spotless. <laughs> All that is pointing to who? Jesus. The blameless sacrifice of God that was offered once and for all, according to the book of Hebrews, for the redemption of mankind. And as the children of Israel were about to leave, they get into the Exodus when Pharaoh was all fed up with Moses and tells him, come on now, get you people out of here. Moses told the people, the Israelites, before you leave, do what? Have a meal together because there's going to be a visitation. And the visitation will be such that when you have slaughtered the lamb that was blameless, that was male, take the blood of the lamb and do what? Apply it on the door posts of your homes and when the angel of darkness rather the angel of death comes what will he do when he sees what the blood he will do what he'll pass over you that is how the feast of the passover came about and up to this day the jewish people celebrate the passover feast now let's come into the New Testament. When Jesus is about to be crucified, what does he do? He has the last supper with his disciples. What were they celebrating during the last supper? The Passover feast. Are you getting me now? And this time, it is not about a lamp that is going to be sacrificed. Jesus himself provides himself as the lamp of sacrifice for the redemption of of mankind. And so in the New and in the Old Testament, we see a parallel of God's message that is central to the cross. You cannot but just see how God, right from the very beginning, he was trying to bring people to the place where when Jesus comes, he becomes the perfect sacrifice that God had already prepared for this particular work. On the cross. And again, if I may take you to the Roman uh, history and also Roman way of doing things. By the way, those days, you know, 
uh, in the Roman period, you know, there was the Roman Empire. Those guys ruled. They were like the Nazis. You know, they were like the, uh, what do you call him, Alexander the Great. You know, he conquered so many places. You know, they were like Nebuchadnezzar who had about 120 provinces. So the, 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 you know, the Roman Empire was the authority then. It was the, the power that was. And one of the ways that they, uh, you know, reprimanded people or gave punishment to people was through crucifixion. So in terms of crucifying people and the cross, there was nothing very spiritual about it. The person who hung on that cross is the one who gave it the significance that is there. Are you getting me now? Otherwise, those days, if you did some felony or you did something that was not in line with the Roman law, the other way they would make sure that you suffered and you died is by putting you alive on that cross. And people would walk by looking at you suffer up to the point where you die. It was an excruciating pain. In fact, somebody said the root word of excruciating is crucify. It was a torment. It was a public spectacle, as we read earlier on. It was a degrading and a very demeaning experience to be in. And that is what we see Jesus going to the cross in a demeaning way. In an excruciating time, he cries out, Abba, Father, do not forsake me. In the garden of you know, Gethsemane, he cries and he says, Oh God, in this hour of carrying the sin of mankind, do not leave me. And so when Jesus was crucified on the cross, what happened? The two sides of God's love were fulfilled. And what are the two sides of God's love? God's justice and God's mercy. What is justice? Justice involves the dispensing of deserved punishment for wrongdoing. While on the other hand, mercy is all about pardon and the compassion for an offender. And according to God's law, sin must be done what? Must be punished. Sin must be judged. And the wrath of God comes upon everyone that is a sinner or one who sins. God's judgment is on the sin, but he's having this forgiving spirit for the sinner. That's why some people don't quite understand God because they say, how can a loving God do anything like this? It's because God comes with a double-edged sword. There is his mercy forgiving, forbearing, his grace that is unmerited, and he gives us everything that we need in life. But I'm telling you, the other side of the same sword is a sword of judgment. And the Bible says that the soul that sinneth shall surely die. In other words, God judges the sinfulness of man. The same God who loved the world and died for the world, later on he comes in judgment at the end times, and he's going to condemn the sinners and the devil into the lake of fire. I'm telling you, hell is as real as much as heaven is real. Do you believe in heaven and hell? I know you guys in America, you, you feel good. You, you, you like to, you know, just enjoy life. You know, uh, we, we, we got it all together. But I'm telling you, hell is real as much as heaven is. And whether people accept it or believe it or not, that is the truth. That is the fact of the matter. And what we are doing here on earth, we are either making our way into the presence of God or running away from the presence of God into his condemnation. Now, that brings me now to the message of the day. I was just laying the premise that the cross is very central to our faith. You remove the cross, there is no message. You remove the cross, the sacrifice for the atonement of mankind, nowhere. The redemption of mankind, nothing. And so the cross becomes 
the very central thing that we should look to if we are going to receive any blessings from God. Allow me to share with us eight benefits that we can draw from the cross of Jesus. Are you following me? I can see some of you writing notes. I like that because I'm a teacher by a profession. You, you write down some stuff. If you have your, uh, your device, you can open it up and just write down some of these things that the Lord is going to deposit in your spirit. Number one, that Jesus was punished. One of the things about the cross was punishment. The person who was put on the cross, it was all about punishment. And when they dragged him through the streets of, you know, Bethlehem and got him, you know, into Jerusalem and got him to the cross, it, it was a painful experience. It was a punishment. And those Roman soldiers were beating him up and making sure he really gets it. And, you know, they took him to this place where they flogged him. It was a punishment. It was a punishment. And I'm here to announce that Jesus got our punishment so that we can receive his forgiveness. We don't need to suffer because of our sins. You know, some people, they tell us, you must do this. You must not eat like this. You must dress like that. You, you must go, I don't know where. You know, and we, we have all this methodology and many things that people have tried to make to be substitutes of what Christ has already accomplished for us. The Bible says we do not need to go through any more suffering because of our salvation. Jesus already got our punishment. He already paid our debt. For what we would have received, he took it upon himself. Are you following me, people? Can I use this illustration? There were two boys. One was called John. The other one was called Jack. They were identical twins. Have you ever met identical twins? Sometimes those guys can play jokes on you. <laughs> In fact, <laughs> I see quite a bit on uh, social media. Uh, people, you know, <laughs> doing funny things because of identical twins. Uh, you know, but... Something about identical twins, sometimes they can fool you. And I don't know why parents do this. When they dress them, they dress them in the same color, in the same style. They even complicate the whole thing even more. So Jack and John were identical twins. And something about John is that when he was born, unlike Jack, he had a weak heart. And so they treated him with that kind of a fragile. You know, he, they never gave him heavy work to do or send him out to do heavy things. You know, he, he was always, you know, kind of guarded. And even when they would go to school, it is Jack who would carry John's bag so that John does not get tired because he has a weak heart. And like every other boy, you know, once in a while, he, John would want to be like, you know, the other boy. So... In school, he would go out and play football like all the other boys. Now, one day, Jack and John were with other boys. They were, they were playing this soccer, you know, game. And, you know, the way the boys do this and do the other. But Jack, brother, John at some point kicked the ball. And you know what the ball did? It went to the principal's office and it hit the window of the principal and the window broke. Now, that principal was a very vicious guy. How many of you are raised up in that kind of way? Oh, my goodness me. You dare not go to the principal's office because he would whack you with six canes. By the time you're coming out of there, you cannot sit for two weeks on the chair. <laughs> I'm exaggerating a bit. <laughs> so, anyway, the principal comes out and he says, Who hit the ball that broke my window? They knew who had done it. And, and somehow, Jack, because he knew if the brother would go to the principal's office and get the six canes, he would not take it because of his weak heart. So Jack said, no, I'm, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one, I'm the one who kicked the ball and hit the, the window. Uh, it is me. And so the principal said, come here. So the principal took him into his office and told him to bend over. Because he was going to give him the six canes. 
but just about the time when he was just about to, you know, drop the cane onto the behind of this boy, who comes rushing out into the principal's office, John, and John says, no, 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 it is me, it is me who did it. And right there, the principal got to know that John and Jack were identical twins. And one was willing to take the punishment of the other so that the other one does not take their punishment because they were part of the weak house. Can I bring the message home? Jesus knows that you could not take the beating. You could not have taken that suffering. You could not have bore that punishment. So what did he do? He offered himself. The Bible says there was dead silence in the heavens. And he said, who will open the seals? <laughs> and it's only the voice from heaven that says, only the son of God, Jesus, had the power to open the seals. In other words, he was the only one who could take the punishment of going to the cross and suffering for our sins. And today, as I bring this message, I would like to bring it very clearly that you don't need to suffer nothing in order to merit the forgiveness of God. You don't need to do anything because Jesus has already taken the punishment on your behalf. Can somebody say amen? Are you getting this message now? Yes. If you read in Isaiah 53, verse 4 to 5, this is what it says. For surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. And the punishment that brought us peace was upon him. And by his wounds, we are healed. So benefit number one that we receive from the cross of Jesus is that we don't need to work for our salvation. Jesus already paid for it. You don't need to do any gimmicks and any theatrics in order to win the mercy of God. No, no, no. You don't merit the mercy of God. You receive it. It is there by the grace of God. By faith, you embrace it. And it becomes part of your life. And if you're here not born again, this is your message. That Jesus paid it all. Jesus was punished. He was denied. He was taunted. You know, they played jokes with him. So that you do not need to suffer for salvation. Number two, what is the other benefit that we can draw from the cross of Calvary? Can I suggest to us that Jesus was wounded so that we might be healed? You know, the Bible says again, when they took him to this place. By the way, I've been to Israel several times. Every year, the Lord helps me. I normally... Uh, put people together, and we go to Israel. Uh, I've been doing that as a ministry. Uh, somebody was challenging me at some time. I was telling me, oh, must you go every year? I told him, no, this is a ministry. <laughs> and what I do is I normally get as many people from our church back at home in Kenya, and we, we, we go to Israel. And the beauty about going to Israel is that you are able to walk in the very same places that Jesus walked. All these stories that you read, the Bible cities, you see them Live, I pray, mom, that we, we get this team to, to go. And that's why I actually got to know when the Muslims go to Mecca. Do you know they go to Mecca at least once in a lifetime? But some of you, you are going to go to heaven before you go to Israel. <laughs> now, them, they purpose. And I got to know why they go is because when these guys go around that Kaaba thing, they call it, eh? And when they pelt, I don't know, there's something they normally pelt with, uh, with stones. And when they do this sacrifice <coughs> in Mecca, when they come back, my friend, you cannot uproot that man from Islam. Because he has literally touched and been in the places where the founder, Muhammad, stayed. And how much more even for those of us who are born again. You know, one of the things I normally do when I take people there, we go to the River Jordan where Jesus was baptized. And you know, I have the pleasure of dipping people in there in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. You know, we go to Mount Carmel where Elijah fought the 450 prophets of Baal. And we stand there and we say, oh God, just like you did for Elijah, 
do it also for my marriage. Do it also for my business. And we claim every promise that is ours. You know, we go to the crucifixion place. You know, today mom took us through the time of Holy Communion. Right there in the garden tomb where Jesus' tomb is there. You can see it. <laughs> we go and we have Holy Communion. My goodness me. When you come out from that journey, you are deeply rooted in your faith. And so what was I saying? <laughs> I was not here to <laughs> promote my trip to Israel. But God, now that he has brought me to this land, I think one of the things that I'm going to be doing, and Sister Evelyn, I would like to take you with uh, Gunda here together with us. And we sing in Jerusalem. By the way, there is a place, a big amphitheater. We, we, we can do a big music something there. You know? Jesus was wounded so that we might be healed. They took us to the place, this place where he was held up on this pillar and they slashed his back. They whipped his back with a special whip that when the, they put it on his back, it literally pierced and plowed his back and blood came out from him. I was talking with somebody and they were saying that the seven wounds that Jesus received on the cross symbolize the seven different medical conditions that we can ever suffer. Can I bring that again? Yeah, you go do some research. You, you guys are good in Googling. <laughs> but I, I talked with somebody who was telling me that the wounds, how many wounds did Jesus have? One, two, three, four. And then? Five, six, and then seven. Each one of those represents a certain type of sickness that we experience as mankind. Even the nail, and the whatever, the, 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 the crown they put on his head, it touches on all mental illness. And God can be able to heal you from that depression. He can be able to heal you from that cancer. He can deliver you from that blindness. So the Bible says that he was wounded so that we can be healed. Do you believe in Jesus healing your life? <laughs> because I'm talking to people here and some of them are looking at saying, No, healing is for some other people, not for me. But I'm here to let you know if you're needing a touch. You know, our sister talked about God touching her womb so that she can have a baby. You know, God can also do that for you. Maybe you have a tumor or you have a condition that has repeatedly come over your life. Or you're like the woman who had the bleeding issue, you know. Or you're like bland but Myers. Whatever you represent, one of the things that we can draw from the cross of Jesus Christ is that he was wounded, he was beaten, he was able to bleed so that we can receive every healing that we need for this life including mental illness. We suffer a lot of mental illness. That's why people are going to school and shooting everybody else. Those guys are mentally unstable. They need healing. I was even telling somebody the other day, some of us who are intoxicated and addicted to drugs and substance abuse, that is another healing that we can receive only when we apply the blood of Jesus over our lives. When we allow the Holy Spirit of God to come and help us to deal with some of these vices, and works of darkness that we cannot otherwise, with all the counseling, you, you've gone to rehab in and out, but it doesn't help you. I'm telling you, talk to Jesus and call on him. And that blood will deliver you from every addiction. Praise the Lord. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. What does it say? He himself, not anybody else, bore our sins in his body. On the cross, so that we might die to sin and live for righteousness. And by his wounds, you have been healed. You have been healed. Is there somebody who is needing healing here? God is here to heal you. The message of the cross is about healing. God can heal. And he's healing even today. He's out here. Touching somebody, moving into a situation in your life, and he can heal you. Number three, let us continue. We are talking about the eight benefits that we can draw from the cross of Jesus. Benefit number three is that Jesus was made sin for our sinfulness. 
so that we might become the righteous with his righteousness. If you read 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 21, it says that God made him, that is Jesus, who had no sin to become sin for us. So that in him we might do what? We might become the righteousness of God. It's futile when I see people trying to appease themselves to God, trying to get into all kinds of, uh, you know, rituals and, uh, uh, you know, church uh, things so that they can try to win the forgiveness of God. We visited one temple when we were doing world religions. We went to China, and uh, they took us to this temple. And these people, in the way of appeasing whichever God they pray to, they have a, a kind of a way that goes to a shrine at the very end there. And when you get to this worship place, one of the things that you do is you remove your shoes, and you go on your knees, and you go literally on your knees up to the point where you touch the shrine and kiss it, and then you'll be okay. I looked at that and I said, my goodness, man. I wish these people could know that Jesus did all this for them. That's why the Bible says that the message of salvation is foolishness to those who are perish. But it's the power of God. It's the power of God for salvation for those who are believing. If you see the kind of things that people do in the name of trying to appease their God, in the way of trying to seek the, the forgiveness of their God, you will realize that when Jesus died on the cross, we don't need to do anything. All we need to do is have faith in him, believe, accept, and repent. And what do we do? We receive freely the forgiveness of our sins. became sin so that we can be made righteous. For those of us who are theological, again, that is what we call divine imputation. Where God removes sin from you and he imputes in you his own righteousness. In fact, if you tried to become righteous by yourself, in the Old Testament, the Bible says that your own righteousness is like but filthy rags. It does not meet the standard it does not meet the qualification before God. So, my friend, you cannot say, me, I don't smoke, me, I, I don't chase after, I don't know, I, I don't do this. No, no, that is not enough. It's not about being good. It's about applying the blood of Jesus over your life. And until that blood is on the doorpost of your house, then the angel will pass over. But if it is not, you are going to die. With all your philanthropy, with all your goodness, you know, some people think it's because of the way they give philanthropically. No, no. It's not good things. It's not good deeds only that take you to heaven. You must have faith in, in God. You must believe that he died on the cross. If that has never hit home, then everything else you're doing here is just what we call religious practice. And religious gimmicks that do not save they only lead you deeper into religiosity and they take you far away from God. Such like even the, the, the Pharisees, you know, the Messiah was with them, but they were so blinded into this law of Moses that they could not see Jesus as their Messiah. And up to this day, whenever I go to Israel, you find them on the wailing wall and they are doing like this 24-7 asking for the Messiah to come and emancipate them from sin. Yet they didn't know the person that they crucified on the cross was the very Messiah that had been predicted by the prophets in the Bible. And something that Jesus did, does is that he takes away your sin and he gives you his righteousness. Somebody say amen. amen. Come on, are you learning something this morning? Can I continue to number four? Jesus died our death so that we might share in his life. Now, when I go to funerals, this is the message I like to preach. That Jesus died so that we do not have to die anymore. Did you know that? You know, for you, you will not die if you are born again. What you do, you just translate from 
this physical into the spiritual. From the mortal to the immortality. That's why Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, if you read from verse 13 to 18, he says, we are not like those who mourn hopelessly. Because we know that those who die in the Lord will also with the Lord be raised into the resurrection of life. When the trumpet of God shall sound, the dead in Christ shall rise first. And they will go and be with the Lord in the air. And they will reign with him for a thousand years before everything else is brought again to a conclusion. There's something called death and life. And Jesus died so that you and me don't have to die. I know that is paradoxical. But when Martha and Mary came to Jesus, he told them that I'm the life and I'm the death. <laughs> yeah. Anyone who believes in me, though they die, yet they will live. Do you have that hope in your life? One of the things I normally tell people when we go to bury the dead, one, uh, you know, one of the places that we go to is uh, Egypt on our way to Israel. And when you go to Egypt, you see these big pyramids. And there are the seven wonders of the world. You know, like one of the biggest is the, the pyramid of Giza. And my goodness me, my elder, when you look at this thing, you wonder how with the technology of that day, these people could be able to erect such monuments. And what were these monuments? There were graves, tombs for their pharaohs. Because their pharaohs believed that they were gods. And so from the moment he ascends on the throne, he starts to build his pyramid. And when he dies, what do they do? They bury him in the pyramid. And how did they bury them? They buried them together with all the gold and with all the, 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 the richness that this man had. No wonder when people went to discover the pyramids in Egypt, what did they do? They went and plundered the richness that was in those places. Before Egypt, you know, came to understand that when these people come, they go to plunder the riches that is in there. The other thing I also got to discover, there are other smaller graves, I mean pyramids, smaller ones around the pyramid. And I was told that those small pyramids are actually the graves of the wives of the pharaoh. So when they were burying the pharaoh, they made sure also he's buried with his Wives, because he would need them in the life to come. That is their belief. We believe in the resurrection, in reincarnation. That when you leave this life, there is another one you're headed to. Now, that is futile, because there's nothing like that that you know. For our friends who are Indians, they also believe in reincarnation. And that's why when they see... Uh, a cockroach cross like this. Don't you dare go and kill that cockroach in the eyes of those guys from Asia. Because they believe that that could be one of the ancestors. <laughs> they, 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 they took another body of a cockroach. <laughs> now, I'm not, you go read this stuff now. Uh, this is documented, okay? This is not just my blah, blah thing here. No, 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 no. I'm not just breathing hot air here. You can go read, do research. They believe in reincarnation, and they believe you can become a lizard, you, you can become, uh, you know, a cow. You can become like a pussy, which some of you like having. <laughs> but that is futility of mankind. Because without the applying of the cross of Jesus, it is all futile. It is all useless. And the Bible says that Jesus died on the cross so that you and me don't need to die anymore. He died so that we can be able to live. If you read in Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 9, let's read together. But we see, what do we see in Jesus who was made lower than the angels for a little while, now crowned with glory and honor because he suffered death so that the grace of God, he might test death for Everyone. And when Jesus died on the cross and when he resurrected from the dead, again, according to the Jewish worship, he became the first fruits of those who die and are resurrected. 
<laughs> because he died and he resurrected, even you and me, when we die, we shall do what? We shall resurrect into the newness of life. Wow, I like this gospel. Number five, we are looking at the benefits of the cross. I'll be finished in a short while. Jesus became poor with our poverty so that we might become rich with his riches. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, the Bible says, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, I mean, he had the whole of heaven. The Bible says that the gold and the silver belong to him. A cattle of a thousand hills belong to him. And so sometimes even when we are doing our tithing and our offering, man, we are not helping God. We are helping ourselves. It is about you and not him. We cannot give anything to God. He owns all things. And so the Bible says here that he became poor so that we who were poor can become what? Rich in him. Rich in him. We can become rich in him. What is it that you want? Seek ye first the kingdom of God. When you have embraced this Jesus, I normally tell people when you have possessed him, he also brings with you his possessions. When you have him, then you have all that you need in life. The Bible says just ask and you will receive whatever you desire of him. We are rich because he became poor. In fact, they had to go do a miracle and get a fish to give out a coin for him to pay his taxes. You guys are supposed to be filing your taxes this April? <laughs> American citizens, hey, hey, are you there? Yeah, Jesus had to ask for a fish to be brought so that they could get a coin from that fish to pay taxes. That's why paying taxes is also biblical. It's also spiritual. Somebody say amen. Don't dodge. <laughs> if you don't walk in paying the taxes, you're not paying, you, you're not living right. Oh, sorry, I, I didn't mean to go in there. So I, I didn't mean to condemn nobody. But what I'm saying here is that what Jesus did, I want to do also. Uh, where Jesus went, I want to go. What he did, I want to do. What he said, I want to say. In Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 12, rather 10, it says like this. In bringing many sons and daughters to glory, it was fitting that God from whom and through whom everything exists should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. In other words, Jesus, where am I? I've gone ahead. Uh, Jesus became poor with our poverty, so that we can become rich with his riches. That is 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. For we know that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that through him being rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that through his poverty you can become rich. Number six, I would like to also suggest that the other benefit that we can draw from the cross of Jesus. Can you turn to your neighbor and talk about, to tell them the cross of Jesus. Come on, look at the other neighbor with an attitude and tell them it's only the cross of Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Oh, yes, that's what we are all about here. That's why we are taking Holy Communion today because it points us to the cross. And Jesus bore our shame so that we might be able to share his glory. Let me bring some message deep here because, you know, one of the things that sin does is that sin comes with guilt. And sometimes when we come to God and ask for forgiveness, for many of us, we allow him to take away only one part, which is guilt. But we are left with the shame. And that's why the devil likes to revisit with us and reminds us, did he surely say so? Did, did he mean that, you know, that thing that you did has been covered? It's because many of us, in as much as God has forgiven us, but we have not done what? We have not forgiven ourselves. You know? We still walk around with downcast spirits and we, we keep on blaming ourselves and saying how God has forsaken you or God is not for you and, and how things are not just coming through for you. You make it look like as if you are shameful about the salvation 
which God has brought to us. One of the things I would like to pray for today is that if you are ever living with a past hangout on your head, things that you did in the past, if God has already taken care of that. In fact, the Bible says that he has taken away our sins as far as the east is from the west. And he has thrown our sins into the sea of forgetfulness. We should not go back and fish in them. In bringing many sons and daughters to the glory, it was fitting that God, for whom and through whom everything exists, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through what he suffered. Number seven, just one more and we'll be done. Benefit number seven is that Jesus endured our rejection so that we might have his acceptance as his children. And I don't know whom I'm be speaking to this day, but you know, there are some of us who have gone through rejection. Maybe your husband rejected you. Or your wife rejected you. Or it could be even your, your parents rejected you. You know, life comes to us sometimes in very bitter pills. But one of the bitter pills about life is rejection. That person that you loved so dearly, you know, when at the last minute they tell you now, you know what? You're not going to get me. I normally use this story of this gentleman I knew way back in Kenya. You know, he uh, he, he really wanted to get married. And so sometimes he would come and tell me, Pastor, you you help me look out for this guy here. You know, I, I really want to get married. Pray with me. And indeed, somehow, out of his own travail, he managed to get a good lady that he wanted to get married to. But supposedly, as it would be in any relationship, you know, people exchange gifts, don't they? So he, he was the one who would gift this lady so much. And he, he would give and give and give and give and whatever. So he was hoping that with the giving, he's going to get a kind of marriage. But believe you me, a time came when this guy looked at this man and his character, and he said, this guy I cannot get what? Married to. And so he left him. And he came and told me, you know, that girl left me. She jilted me. And as if, I don't know, I, I, I don't remember giving him that, you know, uh, authorization. But he went literally to that girl and told her, okay, that phone I bought you, please, please return it. <laughs> yeah. he, he literally repossessed what he had given out. Now, Jesus does not do that with you. There are no strings attached. When you give your life to Jesus, it is freely you have received, freely give. And it is more blessed to give than to do what? Than to receive. And one of the things that Jesus does is that he was rejected. My goodness me. Even what you call him, Peter, at the very crucial moment, he said, I don't know that guy. I've never been with him. I've never walked with him. Have you ever gotten to a place where people that you thought would stand with you in a situation leave you hanging hot and dry? And sometimes some of those people could be the very closest people that you ever think about. The people who stab you in the back are the Judases, the people that you share the meal with. I normally tell people, if you have ever been hurt in life, one of the places that we get deeply hurt is in marriage. Because in marriage, we commit ourselves to one another until death do us apart. And we give ourselves wholeheartedly. And one of the places that people have been hurt deeply is when there is betrayal and when there is rejection in marriage. That is one thing that will make you be redundant in life and will make you become a bitter person. And that's why for those of us who are married, God has created this institution to be a place of joy, of fulfillment, of enjoyment, of companionship. 
a place where we can draw from one another and grow with one another. But you know, there are some marriages, my goodness me, people kick each other around and they knock each other's heads. And I'm telling you, there are even people who have made bruises on one another in the name of marriage. One of the things that Jesus did is that he was rejected so that anybody who is here this morning that is feeling rejected, know that he is embracing you. He is the father to the fatherless. He is the defender of the widow. He is the one who ministers to those who are low in family. He will reach you at the point where you are. You don't need to look at the world as if it has collapsed around you. All you need to do is go to the cross. And he will receive you. The Bible says there is no Jew, there is no Gentile. There is no male, there is no female. In God, there is no race of purification. There is no discrimination. There are no biases with God. He receives every one of us irregardless of our status, of our decree in life. He receives you. You don't have to be learned to be received by God. You know that you have to be poor to be received by him. In other words, you don't do anything to merit his grace that God gives us from the cross. He endured rejection so that we can be accepted as sons in the kingdom. Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 5 and 6. It says like this, he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. <laughs> It is not your thing. It is his will. It is his pleasure. To the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one that he loves. Eighth and lastly, and I go to prayer. I know I've gone a little bit overboard, but I hope you are being blessed. And even those that are watching online, we pray that God may reach you wherever you are and minister these benefits of the cross. Number eight. Jesus became a curse so that we might receive his blessing. You see, the other thing about the cross, and we are going to read here in a short while. In fact, let me just read it. In Galatians chapter 3 and verse 13 to 14, it says like this. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hung on a pole. He redeemed us in order that the blessing given to Abraham might come to the Gentiles through Christ Jesus so that by faith we might receive the promise of the Spirit. And what is the promise of the Spirit? That he was made a curse so that we who are already condemned and who are supposed to die because of our sin, he took that curse upon himself. I don't know whom I'm speaking to here. You know, we being the Africans that we are. You know, sometimes we come from those backgrounds where they say a certain auntie came and stood <laughs> in the compound and said, no of these ladies in this home is now a part of this man. And probably you have come to the United States and that demon is still hanging around you. None of the guys here is ever going to university. They will never become anything in life. Have you ever heard those stories? That some auntie said or some uncle came and uh, pronounced certain things, you know. Uh, you guys are looking at me like that. Too. Oh, you know what we left back at home. And some of us, we have come from there and those things are still hanging on now. I was told I can never bear children. I was told I can never get a job. I can never have anything that will satisfy me because somebody pronounced something over you. Or it could be some juju fellow who did some gimmicks around you. You know, the devil is a liar. And some of these things that he does, some of us, we like to play them down. But Juju is very real. Just the way the salvation goes over his life. You know, when Moses put the road down and it became a snake, even the, the, the Juju guys of Pharaoh, they also threw their, <laughs> their roads and they also became what? <laughs> so don't ever downplay black, black magic. Don't ever black, <laughs> downplay spiritism. You know, some of you go to the, the, this place where you, your palm is red. I'm telling you, there are demons that are being infused into your spirit, if you did not know. 
some of these games that we get involved into and the people do certain things and make certain incantations, you think it is a way of how they kick the... No, no, they, there's a certain spirit there, that, you know. For, or you go to some of these places where some of us come from and some people are telling us, you know, you pour this blood, you know, you, you do this. Those libations they are doing, those are all things that are trying to counteract what Jesus did for us on the cross. Those days when we were back home, before a child is dedicated, particular mama wana kuja, you know, those mamas come, and they do the old ladies, and they hold the baby, and they cut the hair like that, and they pronounce certain things over your child. Some of you look at me like, oh, this is this baby. Oh, they took the umbilical cord, and I don't know what they do with it. Hello, Africans, do we, we, do we? <laughs> Are you together with me now here? <laughs> and you know, some of you are still operating in that grace, in that, <laughs> you know, in that confusion, in that miasma of confusion. I'm here to let you know that Jesus became a curse so that you can be blessed. And the Bible says, whoever has been blessed of God, no one can be able to curse. You are blessed full and full and forever because what God has blessed. It doesn't matter which juju you apply. It doesn't matter which place you go to to get whatever that you want to get to come and bewitch me. It cannot touch me. The Bible says a thousand shall fall at my side and ten thousand at my right hand. And none of it will come to my tent. Every tongue that raises itself, it will be condemned in Jesus' name. Every weapon that is fashioned against me, it will not be prospered. In Jesus' name. Jesus took it all on the cross. He became a curse. He was rejected. He was, you know, these guys came and plunged a spear just to taunt him and to see. And they were even telling him, if you are indeed the son of God, why don't you redeem yourself from the cross? He did all that so that you and me can enjoy this salvation that is free and that is rich. Can we bow our heads as we go to the Lord in prayer? Take a moment and just reflect. If somebody could just come and play the keyboard here. Just take a moment and reflect in this hour. It is my prayer that on this Easter weekend, this Resurrection Sunday, that you are going to appropriate by faith every blessing that we can draw from the cross of Jesus. Jesus is still in the business of redeeming people and reconciling them to God. And if you're here by chance and you're not born again, that is where it begins from. The Bible says there is therefore no condemnation to those who have been saved, those who have been born into the family of God. Could you be here this morning and you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? Probably you have been hanging out on the faith of your father, of your family, of your heritage. But you know, when it comes to matter salvation, it is very personal. Could you be here in this lovely place this morning? And you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. I would like to begin from there. Just lift up your hand and I'm going to pray together with you. Are you here? And you want to say, Jesus, you died on the cross because of me. But I'm willing to embrace you. I'm willing to receive you into my life. I want you to be my Lord and Savior. I want you to come in and make the difference. Maybe you've been trying to make life for you. But Jesus is saying, you don't need to make life for you. I've already made life for you. Is there one? I don't want to assume that all of us are born again. But are you here in this place? And you do not know Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. Just lift up your right hand where you are. And I'm going to pray together with you. I'm going to pray together with you. Just lift up your right hand. And I'll pray with you. You want to receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Just lift up that right hand. And I'll pray together with you. Hallelujah. Just lift it up high so that I can see everybody. Thank you, young man. I see that. I'm going to pray with you in a short while. Is there another? And you're here in this place. This lovely church of divine encounter. But you have never encountered him. It begins by you accepting him as your personal Lord and Savior. Just lift up your right hand. We want to pray together with you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. 
I'm going to ask the young man to just lift it up your hand. If you could just make your way to the altar here. Just come, just come, the two of you. I'm going to pray with you in a short while. But we are still in that mood of prayer. And uh, quickly, if you can come and help me with this song. And uh, as we just get into another time of prayer, maybe we could stand now. We just let's stand together. And it's this song that was on my heart. Let the weak say I am strong. Let the poor say I am rich. Let the blind say I can see. For it is what the Lord has done for me. And as we sing that song, I sense in my spirit there are people here who are wrestling. I don't know with what. And you need God to apply the work of the cross over that situation. If you need any special prayer for whatever that I've mentioned here, maybe you are living under a lot of fear. You know, you're born again, but you you, you just have fear. You, you're apprehensive and it's like, you know, you're uptight and you need the peace of God. One of the things that also Jesus does is that he gives us his peace that passes all understanding. Could you be struggling with some sin in your life? Could you be at a place where you're just needing the hand of God in the different graces that I've talked about? If you need that kind of prayer, I'm going to be inviting you also to come to the altar so that we can take time and just pray together with you. Shall we sing together? I am strong. Let the poor say, I am rich. Because of what? Just come, just come very quickly. Our time is over. But I know there are people here who need special prayer. You came into the house of God and you have a burden on your heart. You have something that you need God to deal with. Just come. It could be a family condition. It could be something to do with your finances. It could be something to do with your health. Whatever is your situation, just come. Just come right now. Jesus at the cross, he became all that. Maybe you're suffering. You're in the place where you feel rejected. Just come. We want to receive you in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Just come. Just come. Because of the Lord. Just come. Just come. Just come to the altar. Just stand. Just stand here. Bro. For a gift and a just come, wherever you are, just pray. We want to pray with you. You came into the house of God, but you have a burden. You have something that is hanging over your head. You're not feeling fulfilled. You're feeling like you're lost in your Christian walk. Just come, just come. I want to pray with you. Or you could be sick in your body. We want to pray together with you. We want to appropriate what Jesus did on the cross by praying for you. Just come. For us. And now, just come. We want to pray. Let the wind say, I am strong. And let the poor say, I am free. Because of what? The Lord has done for us. Give just pause it there. I want to just pray for these two young men who have come to give their lives to the Lord. Just repeat this prayer after me. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you love me just the way I am. Today I've heard your word, and now I open up my heart and my life, and I ask you to come in and be my Lord and my Savior. Wash me by your blood from every sin that I've ever committed, and make me today your child. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for writing my name in the Lamb's book of life. Allow me to pray for you now. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for this young man. And as they have come forward to receive you as their Lord and personal Savior, Father, your word says that, behold, the new has come and the old has passed away. 
I pray that you may walk with them, even in their youthfulness. Lord, we know many youth have been taken up by many things. But Lord, we want to pray a special cover of protection over this young man. That they will have a desire to know you, to grow, and to love you, and to serve you with their lives. I commit and I commend them to you. And I pray, oh God, that you may break every hold of sin in their lives. Right now, we destroy and we come against every satanic activity in their lives. And whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And so we receive them into the kingdom. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. The pastor, I don't know you want to take over from there. We are still in a mood of prayer. We want to pray for our sister. She has come forward uh, because she needs prayer. Can we just stretch our hands towards her? And if you're still there, you know, prayer is not painful. It's not anything other than just looking to God. And probably you could be even here and you're trusting God even for your placement. So some of you have been travailing for many years. You, you need God's miracle so that you can get your papers. Some of you have been looking for jobs. You know what? This work of the cross also deliberately helps you to come into God's provision. So let's pray for Mama. Father, in the mighty name of your son Jesus, we thank you because you are able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can ask and even imagine of you. You have told us not to be anxious about anything, but in our prayer and in our supplication with thanksgiving, we may make our request known unto you. And I want to bring Mama to you right now, oh God, as she has come to this altar and as she lifts her burden before you. Lord, you are the one who knows the very details of it. You understand her uprising and even her down sitting. Lord, you are the one who blesses our going in and our coming out. I want to command and I want to decree right now in the name of Jesus. May she receive from you right now. May she receive from you right now. Lord, give her that breakthrough. Oh God, we call on you because you are able. And there is nothing that is impossible with you. And so mama, receive, receive, receive it. Receive it right now. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody say it. Now, everybody, just lift up your two hands as a sign of surrender. I don't know who you are and what is all about your life, but this message is not just about those who came to the altar. It's very possible that sometimes we come into the presence of God with issues and things, and we go back with them. The beauty about the cross is the place of surrender. Burdens are lifted at Calvary. And I don't know what is your situation. I don't know what is your condition. But as you lift up that hand, I want you to just voice it to the Lord right now. As we believe together in prayer, just tell him. If is, it, is it money that you're looking for? Is it a job? Is it, is it a promotion? Is it a healing in your body? Come on now, just talk to him right now. Is it a marriage relationship that is going sour? Is it a child that is wayward? I don't know what, what it could be your need. You, you just call on him right now. Just as we are in that prayer mode, just talk to him right now. The Bible says, whatever you ask, believing in his name, it will be done for you. And so, Lord, we are calling on your name today. And we are believing you, oh God, who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above what we can ask and believe of you, that you may touch every condition, every situation, every anxiety, every fear, oh God, every deficiency in our lives. To, today, we surrender it on the cross of Jesus. Even the confusion that the enemy may have brought around our marriages and our, and our businesses and anything that has to do with us. Father, we are standing on the blessings, the benefits of the cross of Jesus on this resurrection day. And indeed, even as we were led earlier in prayer, whatever was dead in our lives, we want to resurrect it right now. May it come to life. Lord, may you restore whatever that the enemy may have taken away from us. We thank you even for this lovely church. We thank you for Pastor Zipporah and the vision that you have laid in our life. We thank you for those who minister alongside her. And we thank you for every congregant in this particular church. And as they have embraced you and as they have made you the central aspect of their worship. Lord, I pray that this church will spring to become the tower 
the beacon of light in this area and beyond. And we thank you, Lord, for the anointing that you have laid upon your maid servant, not only for Kenya, but even for East Africa. And I know even for the rest of Africa and for the rest of the continents. Father, may you guide her. May you just lift her in that vision. And Lord, we want to bless you even for all the programs that they have in the year that is still ahead of them. And may you guide them into your blessedness and into the fulfillment of your purpose for this divine time that they are living in. We honor you and we bless you because we have asked and we have believed in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And everybody said, come on, let's give the Lord a mighty clap offering of praise and even of thanksgiving. Come on, let's praise the Lord. Let's just celebrate him. Amen. Let's just celebrate him. Amen. I'm also an author. Uh, I've written a lovely book. Here. One of the my pet subjects is mentorship. Um, I like to just walk with people and helping them find their purpose in life. And uh, one of the things that the Lord deposited in my spirit is that this is a missing gem in many of our places. And so if you just want to know and apply this principle in your life on mentorship, the book is available there for only $20. And I believe the Lord will bless you. Come on, celebrate Jesus. You can do better than that. Celebrate Jesus. Hallelujah. He's risen today. Amen. And we thank God for the vessel, the servant of God, our bishop that ministered to us here. Are we blessed this morning, this afternoon? It is afternoon already. Are we blessed? Hallelujah. Resurrection Sunday. You've received a deposit from God because God loves you. And he sent his servant to come and release and tell us about the benefits of the cross. Turn to your neighbor and say, I am a beneficiary of the cross. Yes. Tell them if they don't believe you, tell the other neighbor. Tell them, tell them look at me nicely. Tell them, look at me nicely. I am a beneficiary of the cross. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Glory to God. Thank you, Bishop, so much. We are so blessed and glad that you were sent our way. We receive the message with thanksgiving, and we know that our lives will never be the same again. Thank you, Elder, for speaking into our lives as well, bringing the, the word of the Lord, the now word of the Lord. We receive with thanksgiving. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats for a few minutes as we conclude here. Hallelujah. In the house of God, we receive. And once we receive, we also have a great opportunity to give unto the Lord. Amen. To give our time and our offerings. Because God has been good. How many of you are beneficiaries of God? How many of you have received something from Jesus? So this morning, this is an opportunity to give unto the Lord as you appreciate and, and honor him for what he has done for you. Amen? So let us, uh, the forms of giving are on the screen. Let us uh, go into our pocket, into what we have of value and worship our God with our substance. Amen? This is a wonderful time to respond to what God has has done and spoken into our lives as we give unto him glory to God. Glory to God. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. If anybody needs an envelope, there are envelopes. Put up your hand and there will be an envelope brought to you. Yeah, and you have one hand here. <laughs> Everyone else uh, is able to transact on your beautiful gadgets in your hands. And I'm going to give you a few seconds to add more zeros onto that number that you put there. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen.
Hallelujah. 30 more seconds. Type in quick if you haven't. Glory to God. Amen. All right. We're going to give thanks to God. Father, we thank you. We bless you and honor you this afternoon. We are so grateful for who you are in our lives. We are so grateful for the benefits. Yes, we are here thanking you for all the benefits of what you have done and accomplished in our lives, oh God. We know that we couldn't do it for ourselves, yet you loved us so much and did it for us, that even we are called the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. My goodness, we are righteous before you, and so we are grateful and we acknowledge that you are also the source of everything in our lives. You are Father. You are our Daddy, the source. Father is the source. And so we thank you that you have given to us. You have blessed us so much. Even that blessing that is upon our lives, we acknowledge that it did not come from anywhere but from you. And so in this time and this opportunity of giving unto you, we give with thanksgiving. We worship you with our substance, acknowledging you as the one who has given us everything. And we thank you that even as we give unto you, Lord, you have spoken a blessing and declared that there will be a blessing in us, the, the blessing that is poured out that will not have room to keep it because of your goodness and your faithfulness in our lives. In the name of Jesus, thank you for everyone here. Thank you for your word that you released uh, today to us. Oh God, thank you that yes, you are risen and we have hope for tomorrow. We have hope for eternal life. We have hope for everything in life because of what you did at Calvary. We honor you and we adore you, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for all that we have experienced here this morning. And even as we part ways this, uh, this afternoon, Lord, we thank you as we continue to celebrate the Resurrection Sunday. Oh, God, let your blessing be upon us in the name of Jesus. We thank you and we bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Yes, give, give, give a good offering, clap offering to Jesus. Amen, amen. I'm going to invite you to stand onto your feet so that we close the service uh, this evening. God is good. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And as Bishop has said, the books are available. Pick up your copy uh, even as we finish the service before you go. Your, your Resurrection Sunday blessing <laughs> is waiting for you. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. May the Lord cause his face to shine upon you. May he be gracious to you. As the mountains surround Jerusalem, may the Lord surround you with his grace and with his favor. And in your going out and in your coming in, may the Lord continue to cause his face to shine upon you. And as the angel of the Lord that watches over this house, may that angel go with you wherever you go. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. God bless you. We love you. Thank you for coming this afternoon. I'm going to invite us to go to the fellowship table and as we share a cup of, of something to drink and something to bite as we continue to celebrate Jesus. He's risen and he's risen. What were we told? He's risen. He's risen. Uh -uh. I say he's risen. You say he's risen indeed. He's alive. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Now you are, 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 now you are